Welcome to As I Live and Grieve, a podcast that tells the truth about how hard this is. We're glad you joined us today. We know how hard it is to lose someone you love and how well-intentioned friends and family try so hard to comfort us. We created this podcast to provide you with comfort, knowledge, and support. We are grief advocates, not professionals, not licensed therapists. We are you. Hi, everyone. Welcome back again today to As I Live in Grief. Oh, I tell you every week, but I have to keep saying it because sometimes it's different listeners out there. So, Thanks so much for joining us. And today, like every day, a great guest. I have with me today, Kelly Lynn. Now, the first thing you're going to say is, Kelly Lynn, Kelly Lynn who? Well, no, she's Kelly Lynn. But I'm going to let you tell her that story herself. Kelly, thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me. This is an honor, and I'm really happy to do it. Oh, absolutely. I'm just so happy our paths crossed. So as we get started, could you just tell our listeners a little bit about yourself? Who is Kelly Lynn? Who? Sure. So I am a small town girl from Groton, Massachusetts, which is a very small town. Um, you would have no reason to go there unless you were passing through to get somewhere else, basically, is what I tell people. But I always had big dreams of going to New York City, even when I was a kid, being an actor, being a comedian, being uh, in that life and uh, being on Saturday Night Live. That was my big dream. So I went to New York City when I was 18, right out of high school. And I went to college in New York City and I graduated with a BFA in acting and dramatic. And then I stayed and lived there for 25 years and taught there um, for a number of years at Adelphi University where I went to college. And uh, that was my life. I lived kind of the lifestyle of a, a struggling actor and um, and all of that. And while I was there, I met someone on a website, not a website. It was This was back in the 90s, the 1990s. So Mm -hmm. There were no dating sites or anything like that back then. I was on this thing that was like a game, like a trivia game on uh, America Online. Do you remember America Online back then? Yes, I do. <laughs> and so, you know, those of us who are over 40, let's say, will remember America Online and you would get on on the internet and uh, it was kind of a process back then to get online. You'd get cut off a lot of times and they would say, welcome, you've got mail. And then two seconds later, goodbye, goodbye. And you'd get cut off all the time. Well, I was on America Online and they had this this game room, trivia room, where you would guess uh, 1980s song lyrics. And I went in there one night and there was usually 30 or 40 people in that room playing this game. And this particular night, there was nobody in there except me and this one other person. And he was in Florida and his screen name was Way Above Par. And my screen name was Camel Soft. And we had a five hour conversation and it felt like we knew each other for our entire life. I can't even explain it to this day. And the chemistry was just there. And uh, that turned into me meeting uh, what would become my husband, Don, Don Shepard. And he was, I will say, you know, the love of my life, my best friend. He was everything to me. And we were married four years. We were very, very happy. And then one day he went to work and he never came home. And he uh, had a massive uh, cardiac arrest. They found him on the floor, collapsed, and he was 46 years old. And I was 39 and suddenly widowed. And thus began the new life I never asked for. You know, it, it never surprises me. But it also never amazes me that when guests are telling their backstories and everything, yeah, there are so many of these, and then, and then, and then, and then, and all of a sudden, that's it. Yeah. It ends, you know. But we know, Kelly, you know yourself, that wasn't the end of your life. It was certainly an end yeah. to a spectacular portion of your life. But you, like so many others who have grieved, have kind of worked, wriggled, clawed, scraped, survived your way through that horrible, devastating phase of grief. And I'm not going to say through grief because you still have it, don't you? Of course. It makes it sound like a communicable disease. <laughs> right. <laughs> it's not. Um, and I will grieve until the day I die. But we find our ways through it yeah. to kind of redefine our lives. And you have done just that. Our paths crossed because of a wonderful international group called Soaring Spirits International. And they have an event that they put on in numerous locations every year called Camp Widow. I first heard about Camp Widow through John Polo, who has been a guest on 
this podcast four, five times maybe, and another one scheduled coming up very soon. But he actually was coming to near my area and there was a breakfast being hosted. And I very, very enthusiastically said, count me in, count me in, and drove an hour and a half to meet him. And then was treated with the bonus of meeting not only John, but Kelly and a group of other women who were just delightful, all alumni of Camp Widow. So, so much so that I am now registered for the very next Camp Widow. I'm excited to see you there. (laughs) I will see everyone there. It'll be great to be like a reunion. Yeah, it is. It is. As we met and at this breakfast and after the breakfast, there was going to be a book signing and presentation. And Kelly, your book was one of the two books featured, your book and John Polo's book. I, at that time, had not heard of you. And instantly, the title of your book, My Husband is Not a Rainbow, caught my attention. I'm a writer. I love those titles that really just kind of grab you. Yeah. And I have, uh, I'm reading your book. It's a very thick book, I will say. It keeps me company. First thing in the morning and late th- later at night, uh, out on the deck is the as the light is is dimming and everything, but I'm loving this book. So I want to start off first by saying kudos and congrats on the book. My husband is not a rainbow. The concept of the rainbow, however, is where I'd like to start. And maybe for a lot of people in your conversation, that's where you start. But tell us where the title came from. My husband is not a rainbow. (laughs) Sure. So I believe in signs. And I know a lot of people believe in signs, you know, getting signs from your person who has died or feeling them nearby or, you know, having those moments where you feel like, oh, he's there. I can feel him. I feel his presence. I really believe in that because it's happened so many times to me. Right. Um, I have felt his presence so many times. However, I also feel like I'm the one who knows when it's a sign from him. And I also know what he wouldn't do as a sign. And yes. so my husband is not a rainbow came from a comment that a friend of his had made to me about a week or so after he died. And she's a very lovely woman named Mary. And she was helping me out with uh, our two cats that Don and I had adopted. And she had come over and she had given some me some cat food and stuff like that. She had worked at the volunteer center where Don volunteered and it's actually where he had the heart attack. He was volunteering for a cat and dog adoption center, like a rescue place. Okay. And that's where they found him. He was not at his normal job, which was a paramedic. He was a paramedic. <clears throat> so she came over to help me with with some of the stuff to take care of the cats. And she told me this story while she was at my apartment about how she was uh, driving to the funeral, to Dawn's funeral. And she said, Kelly, I saw the most amazing thing. It was It was a miracle. I was driving to the funeral and it started to rain and then the sun came out and and I was I was crying because you know my friend Don was gone and, and I'll never see him again and I was so sad and all of a sudden I looked up and and I saw a rainbow Kelly I saw a rainbow and it was your husband it was your husband and he was comforting me and he was saying don't cry Mary don't cry it's going to be okay I'm a rainbow now. And I just found that to be the most ridiculous, funniest thing I had ever heard. And I was trying not to laugh in her face, which she said it to me because I know my husband and he would never come back as a rainbow. And he, he hated the state of New Jersey where we lived. He moved there to be with me from Florida and he didn't like it there. He thought it was the most ridiculous state for many reasons. And so he would never be a rainbow in New Jersey. He would not give New Jersey that beauty of himself was written blood in the sky. He just wouldn't do it. Um and he would come back. He was the type of person that would come back as, you know, like a a kick ass guitar solo in an Aerosmith song. That was him. You know, he loved mm-hmm. playing guitar. He loved rock and roll. He loved classic rock. That's how he would come back. Or he would come back right. in a way to make me laugh or he would come back through music somehow, but not a rainbow. That just is not Dawn. So the concept of that made me laugh so hard. And I told her that and she was like, I'm so sorry. You know, that's, that's just what I thought. I thought it was him. And I said, that's fine. You know, and I said, I just, I just think it's funny because that's not how I see him. And it became this thing. It was almost like a revolution of him not being a rainbow. And so I started to do, you know, I was a comedian before his death. And so I started getting on stage and telling this story, among other stories, about funny things that happen after death. Um, And the things people say was a big topic that I would talk about on stage and still Mm -hmm. did. 
And so this story became this revolution in a way, because I would get start getting all of these Facebook uh, posts from other widowed people and people who had lost people they love. And they would send me like sarcastically pictures of, you know, actual rainbows they were seeing in the world. And they would say, you know, I saw I saw Dawn today in Alaska. And I still get them to this day. And every single time it makes me laugh so hard and it makes me smile. And so I'm constantly reminded of of him and his loves and his humor. And he would find the whole thing incredibly funny. So yeah. he's not a rainbow, but he is. <laughs> yep, yep. And, you know, and there's so much in that story. First of all, you had someone who was who loved Don yeah. and loved you enough and wanted to share something with you that her feeling was she wanted to give you some hope Yeah. in, in your moment of desperation as well. She wanted to let you know that there was a connection, that, that it was still there. And that, that Don was still there thinking of her, thinking of everyone. Yeah. I wanted to let you know that. So you had this wonderful friend who felt that way and also felt comfortable enough telling you this story and who you were comfortable enough with in your relationship that you could laugh at her face pretty much. <laughs> and she was still very accepting she was. and felt, then felt apologetic for, for maybe not being as successful as she really wanted. Yeah. And... <clears throat> When we talk about self-care, we talk about community and about finding those people in our lives that will, the the going phrase is, hold space for us. Yeah. That no matter what we say, do, or act like, they are still there with us, for us, to support us. So I just love that story. Now, that certainly is in your book. It's the title of your book. And I love that story for so many reasons. So I have to ask you now, <laughs> you said Don would come back as, a, you know, maybe a really great guitar solo. Yeah. And that's different. And I have a grandson who's, he's 20 now and he's in a band and he's lead guitar and his idol is Slash. So I'm just going to say to you, you might want to listen to Slash's new blues album. Okay. It was just released because you might find Don in one of those solos. There are some awesome solos, guitar solos in that album. And they're going to be songs that you know I'm going to check for the most out. part. So check out that album. I think you're going to hear Don, and I don't even know Don. But you said guitar solos. So I think you're right, because he did love Splash. He loved that kind of music. And so, yeah, I'm, well, I'm going to for sure check that out. There you go. It just came out uh, the 17th of May. In okay. fact. And Splash is going to be in Toronto. Nice. The end of July. Very nice. And I bought tickets for my grandson and my daughter, Stephanie, to go to the concert. And I bought them the VIP package. Wow. So he is going to be at a sound check with Slash. Wow. So just saying, and this is Slash breaking away kind of yeah. from Guns and Roses and going <laughs> toward the blues thing. Anyway, that's all. Well, that's if, they go, if they go see Flash and they see a rainbow at the concert, that'll be that'll be <laughs> OK. Well, I'll, I'll let them know if that happens. <laughs> then they need to take a picture of that yeah. rainbow. <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's the end of July. So, well, that was a segue that, you know, for some reason it just it just happened. But it, it's all related because my family, my grandsons, both of them, um, they're you know, they're the major blessing in my life and they don't know it. But they're my support community. Yeah. I take care of myself by following their things. I follow Nathan's band. I'm at every gig I can possibly be at. I'm at every soccer game AJ plays, every soccer game I can be at. They're my connection and my blessing, as is my daughter. So we cling to those things as we go. Now, I want to get back to your book because, well, it's a big book. I want to make sure we do it justice. <laughs> it is written, I have to say, in a format that I think people will really resonate with. It's not just a start here, narrative, 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 chapter, next. It's not just that. It is a compilation of Facebook posts, blog posts, diary posts, and it is done in such a way that it's like living in the brain of someone who is going through grief from the moment it happened. Yeah. And so often books, we wait until it's memories and then we put those memories down yeah. and we record that and we, we might write them down so it's written like it just happened. But these truly did because you pulled them right from yeah. the times that they happened. Yeah. So I have to really say 
that it's in such a format that's easy to read. And if, to the listeners directly, if you have or are grieving, this book will really resonate with you because you will be able to identify yourself in there. Yeah, you really will. In that desperation, in that depth of grief, in that horrible, awful feeling, the anger, everything, it's all in there. So why did you decide to write a book? So that's a great question. And the main reason, there's there's a couple reasons. The main reason was because I, when this happened to me, when my husband died suddenly and my world shattered and I felt lost and I felt like, what the heck do I do now? How do I go forward from here? I didn't know what to do. Um, writing was one of the things that always comforted me and helped me to heal and helped me to just feel better in the moment. Like the night he died, literally, I started writing and I didn't expect it to be a book. I didn't expect it to be anything. I just started writing because I needed to write. And I was furiously sitting at my computer, just furiously typing out words and thoughts. And I can't believe this happened. And why is this happening to me? And is he really dead? Just brutally honest. And then that turned into Facebook posts that I would put up. And then people started messaging me and saying, these posts are so honest. I've never read anything so honest about grief before. And thank you for posting this because I'm, you know, I'm going through this too. And I'm too, I'm not brave enough to to write something like this. So thank you for writing something like this because right. it's so brutally honest. And so eventually people started saying, you should write a book, you should write a book. And so I did. And it started out as a blog called Rest in Peace, The Life I Knew. And because that's how what it felt like. It's not just a person who died. It's the life. The life exactly. that I knew was gone. Very true. Very true. Yeah. And so um, so I started it as a blog and then I uh, ended up creating this book. But the other reason I wrote it, so the first, that was the first reason because it comforted me, it helped me, and it was helping other people. The other reason was because when this happened to me, I could not find anything as far as grief books out there that I found helpful. And I tried, I read a few things and I was just like, no, nope, this isn't honest enough. This isn't honest enough. Everything was sort of covered in this plastic coating of not telling the absolute truth. And that drived me. So I said, I'm, go I'm going to tell the truth. And that's just how I've always written. That's my writing style. I can't not tell the truth. I have to tell the absolute truth and, and be brutally honest about everything. And that comes with humor. It comes with sadness. It comes with all of it. So yeah, those, those were the reasons that I, that I wrote it and put it out there. Well, I, you know, it needs to, it needs to reach more people, I guess is the first thing I could say. Now, having said that, I know, and I fully understand that's easier said than done. But there are many, many times people on Facebook particularly will say, oh, I just need a book and I can't, I can't read much and everything like that. Well, certainly yours is one that I'm going to recommend. Thank you. you know, up until now, I think Megan Devine probably leads the pack yeah. with hers because hers is pretty close to some of those bare bones. But yours is, I'm going to say, honestly raw. Yeah. And I think that's what people really resonate with. The fact that it really will get them deep down that that's how it feels. Yeah. And they will know that you know this because you have and are experiencing it, not just it happened to you 40 years ago. Right. But you're still dealing with it every yeah. day. Yeah. And there's still good days and bad days. Yeah. Some days, you know, you might go straight through just like you know what you're doing. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, there's going to be one day that's going to be really, really tough. Yeah. And it really covers about a five to six year period, like you said, from the day you exactly. died until about, exactly. you know, and it's written in real time. So it's literally right. day by day by day type thing. And what I really wanted to accomplish, and it sounds like I did, which is makes me very happy, is that I wanted to accomplish the reader experiencing not only my process of going through this, but their own process. Like if you're going through yes. grief and you're going through it, and then you're reading this, it's almost like you're getting to witness somebody, somebody's shifts in grief and somebody's shifts in life as they, yes. and then yes. you're, you're, by doing that, you're witnessing your own shifts in your own Absolutely. grief. And then, and that way, I think it can help you to know that what you're going through is normal, what you're going through, yes. that you're okay, that yes. even though it feels like you're going to die from all this pain, you're not, it's not going to kill you. It just feels that way. Right. And, you know, all those things that people just don't really talk about in an honest way 
I just right. wanted to put out there. Yeah, and it certainly handles the whole issue and topic that so many people, and it seems more lately, are talking about how the first year is one thing, but when you get to that second year and beyond, yeah, that's just as tough, if not tougher. Absolutely. Many people talk about that second year especially yeah. being very difficult, and your book addresses that yeah. because... It stretches beyond just that first yeah. fresh period of grief. Yep. Now, I also have to give listeners, potential readers, a warning. Ready for this? <laughs> this is going to sound really scary. You might laugh. <laughs> okay? Yeah. You might laugh while reading this book. In fact, you should laugh at certain parts reading this book. I hope you get a laugh. It's intended for that. And I had a conversation with another gal just the other day, in fact, about humor and grieving and everything. And we actually challenged people to do one thing every day that will make you guffaw, (laughs) that that will make you spontaneously laugh. Yeah. Just so that you kind of get used to putting that into your grief recovery therapy routine, if you will. Yeah. Uh, you know, go to TikTok, find a dumb cat video, yep. anything, anything that will just make you laugh. Sometimes they even post little videos of tiny, tiny children laughing. And their laugh is so unique that it's just going to make you laugh. Yeah. It's healthy for you to do that. So healthy. What? And so that you know it's possible to laugh again. That's, that's yes. a big part of it. Yes. So tell us more about that. Why, why can humor be so healing, so therapeutic? Well... Humor and pain have always been so connected. They're so connected. I mean, you see it all the time on TV. You see it all the time with the stand-up comedy, stand-up comics. So many comedians find their humor from their pain, from their own pain, from their own hurt, from their own uh, life struggles. And they take that and they um, sort of just say it and put it out there in a way that is funny and that is putting a twist on it. But that's really yeah, what my mind are doing. Yeah, my mind instantly went to a view of Dick Van Dyke coming in the house and tripping over the footstool. I love that. <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and I laughed every time. Yeah, absolutely. And that's that's one of my favorite uh, older sitcoms. I love that show. And I love Dick Van Dyke. And he's like 90, 90 something now. Oh, I know. And he yeah. still dances and acts. He's yeah. great. <laughs> but yeah, but humor is, is so important. It's healing. It's healthy. And I really, truly believe that if you can laugh in times of struggle and in times of hurt and pain and grief, that it also brings out the other emotions that are just as important. Like if you can laugh freely, then you'll probably be also able to cry freely. If you can cry freely, you can laugh freely. It kind of all goes together um, in a very healthy way. If you're holding in those emotions, that's not good. You know, emotions are there because they need to be released. They need Our body needs to release them. And laughter, just the same as sadness, just the same as anger, just the same as all the other emotions that come with grief and life needs to be released. And especially when you're hurting, because you do feel like, will I ever laugh again? Will I ever smile again? Will I ever find joy again? And so finding a little moment, even if it is a cat video or whatever it is that makes you laugh is such a a relief. It's a relief when you're in pain. It's like, oh my God, I didn't think I would ever do that again. And it feels so good the first few times that you really laugh hard. And you might also find that your humor changes after a big loss. I know mine did. Mine got a little darker and a little, the things I joked about were a little darker. I I called them dead husband jokes. And I started getting up on stage and talking about my dead husband and talking about all the ways that affects me because that's what was on my mind. So my humor got a little bit real and a little bit more dark. You may find that your humor changes in some ways. Things you found funny in the past, maybe you don't anymore. Or the opposite, you know, things you didn't find funny, now you do. So it's really interesting to kind of look at your own sense of humor after a big right. loss. Right. Yeah. And, and sometimes we, grieving, we get so wrapped up in keeping our emotions within ourselves. Yeah. We don't want people to know that we're suffering. I mean, come on. Somebody says, oh, Kathy, how are you doing? First thing you say, oh, I'm fine. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm okay. Yeah. I'm not. Not at all. So I want to say that when you're home alone, in your own room, in your own house, and there's no one around, 
nobody's going to know if you laugh. Yeah. So you might just want to practice it a little bit. I mean, pretend you're doing something new. Pretending you're doing some amazing ballet routine or something. Yeah. And just put something on that's going to make you laugh. Find a funny movie on Netflix. Find something on TikTok. Who knows? And it doesn't matter where. Just do it and try to make yourself laugh just once. That's the challenge. Because I think you'll find that, yes, at first you'll think, oh, my God, you know, how disrespectful was that? It's okay. Didn't the person you love brighten up and or laugh or smile as well once you did? Yeah. Didn't they try to make you laugh or smile? Yeah. My husband did. He would do some of the stupidest things sometimes. <laughs> right. You know, right. to make me laugh when actually at the time I probably didn't laugh. I was probably more disgusted by what he did. But thinking about those now still brings a smile to my face. Yeah. And I remember specifically at his memorial service feeling incredibly guilty because I did burst out in laughter at one point um, after the official eulogy was done and the invitation was offered to any friends of Tom's. They wanted to come up and say a few words. One of his good friends, Tim, walked up front very quietly. I never saw Tim in a suit except for that day. Tim came up, stepped up to the podium, and on the podium just set a cup of Tim Horton's coffee. That made me laugh. Now, everybody else, of course, couldn't figure out what was going on. But if you knew Tom, you knew that every morning he had to go to Tim Hortons and have his coffee. Right. And the entire time, for his last days, all of his last days, even when he got to the point where he couldn't drink the coffee without assistance, I would stop on the way in to visit him and buy him Tim Hortons coffee. And for some reason, just seeing that cup of Tim Hortons coffee at Tom's funeral just made me dissolve in laughter. Yeah. I felt horribly guilty, but, oh, I have to say, looking back, that felt so absolutely it's such that a- release of emotions yes yeah. it did and then from that point of course it led to so many people afterward coming up to me and remembering the memory of the tim hortons coffee yep and it was just a wonderful experience so sometimes that humor that we are afraid of yep. becomes a great tool for propelling us forward Oh, it absolutely does. It's a great tool for propel. I love the way you worded that, propelling us forward because it's so, yeah, it's so, well, and sometimes that's what we need because our feet get a little stuck. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. you know, we, we get a little stuck. And it's one thing if my feet get stuck, but I have to be, if I happen to be sitting and it's my butt that gets stuck, there's just no moving me right away. I need more than a cup of Tim Hortons. Yep. And that's where it starts. The little things of that little moment that made you laugh when it was on a I did. And then absolutely finding little videos, like you said, you know, on YouTube or something Mm -hmm. like that. TikTok, because, you know, sometimes it's too overwhelming to think about, well, I'm going to watch a funny movie or I'm going to do this because it's hard to focus in the beginning when you're grieving. And so little snippets is a perfect place to start to just bring it after into your life. And also I would tell people to do what they can to keep surrounding themselves with people in their life that bring them laughter, that yes. bring them joy. And that's yeah. somebody that makes them feel good and supported during those difficult times is a wonderful thing to keep around in your life. Yeah. Yeah. Get yourself comfortable in those situations where you can expose yourself to smiles and laughter. Yeah. Little, little at a time. Yeah. Uh, I, I admit, but eventually it just, it will do it will do amazing things for you in your yeah. I, and I hate I keep coming back to the word recovery. I hate that word recovery, <laughs> but in your healing, I guess yeah. man, that's a better choice in your healing. Yeah. So, so you're finished with your book, Kelly. Yeah. What else? What else? Do, what else are you doing with your life? <laughs> oh, good, all kinds of things. So, um, I'm a certified grief counselor. I, uh, I, I'm here in Massachusetts, and I have a, an office that I rent space at to to meet with uh, clients there. Um, I also meet with people virtually. So anywhere in the world, pretty much, I can I can meet with you virtually and help you process through your grief and through your losses. Um, because we go through so many losses, you know, in our lifetime. And that's why I believe it's so important to be able to process through them and to know how to do that in a healthy way versus an unhealthy way. I don't believe in right or wrong when it comes to grief, but I do believe in healthy and unhealthy. And there's a health way to grief and there's definitely an unhealthy. So people, you know, can in general get more familiar with the healthy ways to grieve and how to do that. And that 
Well, it really does include talking to somebody. It really does. So that's one of the things I do. I have uh, I have the book, of course. I'm do- always doing book events and things like that with the book and um, doing readings from the book and local book events and things like that. I love doing the- that. I'm a speaker. I love to do speaking engagements and host events. I'm a comedian. So I do a lot of comedy where wherever people want to hire me for that. And I even help people to write comedy. Um, So, you know, like if you were writing a speech for a wedding or something, or if you were writing a comedy set yourself, or if you were writing a book or a play or anything, really, I can help coach you through the writing process, help you shape it so that it's, you know, the way that you want it to sound and things like that. So all of that you can find on my website. I have a TED Talk that went viral a few years Mm -hmm. back, which is all about the concept of not moving on when you have a loss, but moving Mm -hmm. forward and moving with. I like to say moving with our loss. Right. Right. Because I really believe we move with them and that it's our choice in the end. You know, once you get through that horrific pain that that comes at the beginning once that pain dulls a little bit and it's more in the background i do believe it's our choice at that point how we move forward and how we live our life and how we choose to carry the loss forward with unite and that can be a big part of of healing as well is how we do that and how we keep those people close to our hearts and 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 um, finding ways to do that that feel really good to us. So, yeah, all of that stuff is on my website, today, which is imtellylynn dot com. Mm-hmm. Yeah, cool. Well, I kind of stole your thunder because I was actually going to turn the microphone over to you, but instead, <laughs> oh, I, you know, I just. <laughs> I just kind of organically switched it and asked you what you were doing. Is there anything else you would like to speak directly to our listeners about? I would just say that if you're going through hard hardships of any kind, losses of any kind, grief of any kind, just please know that it's normal, whatever you're feeling, whatever, however dark it is, however, if you're laughing in this moment, if you're crying in this moment, if you feel numb and you can't cry in this moment, whatever it is, it's normal and it's okay to feel it and it's healthy to feel it and you need to feel it. So the the number one thing I like to tell people just as a general message, because I feel like so many people do this, is stop beating yourself up. Just stop beating yourself up when you're grieving, because so many of us waste our time beating ourselves up for not doing it fast enough or not getting over it, which is not a thing. And, you know, not doing it the way society sometimes wants us to do. And it's hard. It's one of the hardest things you'll ever go through. And so give yourself a break and give yourself love and kindness and uh, give yourself a break. And and when you have trouble doing that, think about the person you lost and how much they love you and try and come from their voice and their perspective and think right. about what they would tell you. Think about how they would comfort you through their death. That's what I right. like to think about sometimes. You know, how, what would Don say to me? He would certainly not want me to sit here beating myself up. He would certainly not want me to, you know, sit here and and blame myself and things like that. So focus on the love. You will get through it. And it's going to be hard, but you will get through it. You will. Right. And Kelly and I both, besides thousands of other people, are here to help you. Yes. You have only to reach out. Yep. That's your choice. I saw a quote somewhere not too long ago that said, and this is so true, that grief is not a passive activity. It requires action. Yep. But you are the one that has to act. Yep. All you have to do is reach out. And I know that's probably one of the hardest things, especially for women. It's hard for us to reach out and say, I need help. Yeah. It's so hard sometimes. Just three words. Yep. All right. Let's shorten it to two. Let's make it help me. Yeah. Let's shorten it to one. Just say help. Yeah. It's all heard. Sadly, Our time is up today. This has been a great conversation, Kelly, and I just know we're going to have to do it again. Yes, I would love that. It went by so quick. I know. It always does. Yet at the same point in time, most of our listeners are probably in the car driving somewhere. And anything like me, I have been known to drive an extra block or two, (laughs) just just finish something because I didn't want to stop before it was done. Yeah. So I want to be considerate of that. Yeah. So tips for listeners today, self-care. And self-care involves finding your community. Find those that support you wherever you are in your healing and will just be there for you to listen, to console, to hug, to encourage, to help, 
Find those self-care, okay? Second, challenging you to do one thing today, one tiny little thing to make you laugh just once. Split second, just a little guffaw. That's all we're asking. <laughs> and lastly, to ask for help. Yeah. So take care of yourselves, everyone. I can't wait until next time. Always going to have a great guest every time. But I always also look back at these episodes and remember and recall and just know that all of these resources are here for you, our listeners. Just reach out. Just ask for help. Take care of yourselves until next time as we all continue to live and grieve. Thanks, Kelly. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening with us today. Do you have a topic that you'd like us to cover or do you have a question from one of our episodes? Please email us at info at asiliveandgrieve.com and let us know. We hope you will find a moment to leave a review, send an email, and share with others. Join us next time as we continue to live and grieve together.